going to share my screen here real quick. Going to get started in just a few moments. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, uh, as we wait for people to join the stream, uh, leave us a comment, let us know where you're watching from today. Hey, Perry. Perry, thanks again for tuning in. Good to see you um, uh, watching virtually. Uh, Barb, uh, good to see you as always. Thanks for tuning in. Leslie, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Perry's watching in Urbana. Barb is watching in Champaign. Leslie is watching from Darien, Illinois. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, we'll get started here in just a couple moments. Marilis Marley, uh, my apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly, but she's watching from Council Bluffs, Iowa. Thanks for tuning in. Get started here um, in a little over a minute. Pat's tuning in from Carol Stream. Rebecca from Champaign. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. We'll get started here shortly. But about one more minute. Rebecca and John watching from Champaign. Thanks for tuning in today. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in um, uh, to this virtual program, History Brought to Life, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, the suffragist Ms. Stanton will join us uh, uh, live uh, in just a few moments. Um, but uh, um, uh, my name is Pat Kane, Public Programs Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie um, uh, in Muhammad, Illinois. Um, and today's program is part of our special exhibit speaker series tied to our newest special exhibit, uh, How Long Must Women Wait? Women's Suffrage and Women's Rights in Champaign County as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution here 
in 2020. Uh, we hope you can visit that once we reopen to the public in the near future. A uh, special thank you to Ms. Stanton, uh, portrayed by Laura Keyes uh, today for being our presenter. Um, and we're gonna get started with that program as, as I mentioned in just a few moments. But before we get there, uh, I did wanna shamelessly, I did wanna shamelessly promote a few things. Um, uh, first, if you haven't done so already, let us know where you're watching from today. Got a lot of people tuning in from uh, right here in central Illinois. Got a couple folks from Iowa tuning in. Uh, thanks to everybody for letting us know where you're watching from and for tuning in in general. We really appreciate it. But if you haven't done so, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. And uh, go ahead and click that share button. Uh, share this stream with your friends so you can watch alongside them and make this program as fun and engaging for all of us as much as we possibly can. For those of you who don't know, um, uh, the Museum of the Grand Prairie, uh, we've been open uh, since 1968. We originally opened as the Early American Museum. Um, and our mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois. And we're also a part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, where we are located at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve in Muhammad. Uh, this special exhibit speaker series is made possible uh, with support from some independent donors, as well as the following women-owned and or women-led businesses and organizations. Um, uh, Campfire Concepts, Shambanamoms.com, Five Foot Productions, Guth and Associates LLC, Jesse Marie Studio, The McGuire Home Collection, Organizing CU, Page Roasting Company, Simply Anchored Boutique, and the right start. Be sure to visit these local businesses or websites and help support these great people who are helping support this speaker series. Um, I got Pat saying, uh, can anyone hear him? Can you all hear me? Uh, Laura, can you hear me? Okay, she can hear me. Um, uh, give me a thumbs up in the comments if you can hear me. Maybe Pat, I'm not sure if there's, um, maybe your volume is muted on your end, but uh, uh, let me know if you all can hear me. I believe you all can still, still hear me, but um, yep, Laura is still giving me the thumbs up. Um, okay, so, and uh, Laura Keller also on the stream is saying, yes, she can hear me. Judith giving me the thumbs up. Okay, so um, Pat, maybe check the volume on your, on your end. Okay, uh, so few things ongoing coming up. Uh, with the Museum of the Grand Prairie, I did want to mention, uh, we have ramped up our social media presence uh, the past few months since we haven't been able to be open to the public. Uh, feel free to check out our museum Facebook page, Twitter page, Instagram, YouTube, um, and, Goods and, and Goodreads pages where we're putting out stories of local history, uh, highlighting different pieces from our museum's collection, educational activities for kids, staff book reviews, virtual exhibit tours, collaborative community events, fun facts, and a whole bunch more. So, excuse me. So, follow us on those social media pages um, uh, if you don't already. Uh, despite the museum being closed to the public, uh, Champaign County Forest Preserve District properties and areas are open for you to explore. So, as you're exploring those, uh, uh, one of those six beautiful forest preserves in Champaign County, uh, exploring those trails, make sure to maintain a safe social distance um, uh, from those around you. And we strongly recommend you to wear a mask while you're out there exploring those preserves. Uh, some other programs coming up tomorrow. We're going to do our first uh, virtual Museum Monday. Uh, Museum Mondays we have take place each summer, uh, but this year we're going to do them virtually uh, with all things considered. Um, and these programs are for visitors of all ages. And we're going to feature a theme each week complete with fun facts, uh, things to do at home, artifacts and stories from our museum's collection, and a whole bunch more. Uh, tomorrow morning, we'll get started with our first uh, Museum Monday, uh, where the theme is Art in Nature, and that program is going to take place live here again on our Facebook page from 10 to 10.30 a.m. Uh, our weekly series, Mornings with the Museum, we're going to have our next edition of that this Wednesday from 10 to 10.30, and this is a weekly Q&A session that we stream again live on our Facebook page, uh, where we have museum staff members along with some special guests on from time to time that will answer your questions live as well as discuss a particular theme each week. Uh, the theme for this week is fantastic friends. We're gonna have some fantastic friends um, on with us from uh, the Champaign County Museums Network, a network that we belong to. And we'll have some of those fantastic friends discuss their institutions as well as what they've been up to the last few months. And we'd love to hear from you as well. So send us in your questions, comments, concerns, and we can have those answered live on that program. Again, Mornings with the Museum on Wednesdays from 10 to 10.30 on the museum Facebook page. 
Another event in this exhibit speaker series coming up on July 19th, uh, Kristen Lems will present the virtual program titled Songs and Stories from the Women's Movement in CU from 1973 to 1983. Kristen is going to perform songs as well as share artifacts and stories from this historic era in local history. Uh, and so that program will again be streamed live on our Facebook page, just like this program is today. Okay, with that, I am going to introduce the suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and let her take over the show, because that's why you all tuned in today, not to hear me uh, speak. Um, so uh, uh, Stanton is portrayed by Laura Keyes. Uh, her degree in library studies and decade plus experience in theater uh, were beneficial in researching and writing this presentation. Mrs. Keyes recently won the Excellence in Performance Award from the Association of Lincoln Presenters. If you have any questions for Ms. Stanton or Laura during the program, please write them down below in the comments. I will be moderating the chat and the comments as we go along, and those questions will be answered at the end of her presentation. Uh, this afternoon, we find Ms. Katie Stanton on May 19, 1866, in her home in New York City. And without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Elizabeth Katie Stanton. All right, Stan, take it over. Oh, thank you. My friends, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Your presence here tells me that you are as concerned with women's rights as I am. Now, I, I don't recall seeing many of you at the recent National Women's Rights Convention earlier this month. This was the 11th women's rights convention by the by oh i never would have guessed that nearly 20 years ago in seneca falls the convention mrs mott and i hosted would be repeated but i'm so glad it has been for our message our voice our work must be repeated until it is heard in every province and hamlet of our country women must have rights equal to that of men. And that is why at the convention, Miss Anthony, Miss Stone, Mrs. Mott, and I formed the American Equal Rights Association. There have been too many arguments over the course of action needed by our advocates. For now that the constitutional amendments are introduced and debated in Congress, our members find our loyalties tested. At this convention, it was proposed that the Women's Rights Society be merged with those attempting to secure the vote for the Negro under the name American Equal Rights Association. Susan introduced several resolutions for consideration. She was particularly concerned with the removal of the word male from the joint resolution before Congress. Despite early signs of abolitionist defections, I believe with the powerful words of Susan, Mrs. Mott, and Lucy, we succeeded in strengthening the link between obtaining the elective franchise for both women and the Negro. Obtain the elective franchise. Some would call that a simple phrase. It takes hardly any breath to give it life. Yet when I first uttered those words nearly 20 years ago, those who heard it reacted as though I had struck them. However, it was not such an outrageous notion to me. Perhaps others had not seen, as I had, even at a young age, the detriment that is the lack of legal rights in this nation. My father's keen legal mind was at times unable to assist the women who sought his help. For there was no legal help for women. When I was a child, too young to be noticed lurking in the doorway of his study, my father, a lawyer and sometime judge, was called upon by Mrs. Flora Campbell. 
the now widowed Mrs. Campbell, and her husband had purchased a farm with Mrs. Campbell's own inherited money. But when her husband had died, he had willed it to their oldest son. Now the son wasn't taking care of the farm and he was insolent to his mother. Well, Mrs. Campbell had come to ask Judge Cady what she could do. And my father said there wasn't anything she could do. When Mrs. Campbell had married Mr. Campbell, she had ceased to be her own person and became in the eyes of the law merely an extension of her husband. All that she owned, all that she earned, even the children that she bore became property of her husband, which he could do with as he chose. And he had chosen to will the farm to their good for nothing son. As soon as Mrs. Campbell left, I asked my father why that was so. And my father took down his law books and showed me the laws printed in bold black letters. So in my girlhood foolishness, I said, the best thing to do was to cut the laws out of the books. But my father explained that wouldn't do any good. The laws must be changed by the representatives in Albany and everyone who represented the people, the men, women, and children of this state were men. No wonder men thought they were so special. No wonder men preferred boy children to girl children. And how could that be so when God had blessed my parents with such a quantity of girls? I was the eighth child born to Daniel and Margaret Cady, who ultimately bore 11 children, though few survived to adulthood. One by one, God took back to his bosom the little boys my parents both longed to have. When I was 11 years of age, my only surviving brother, Eleazar, died. He had recently graduated from Union College. I was sad, of course, that another brother had died and gone to live in heaven. But it was my father who broke my heart. I found my father in the front parlor, quite alone, sitting beside Eleazar's coffin. I heard the wise and forthright Judge Cady weep for his son. And when I came into the room to comfort him, he turned to me and said, I wish you were a boy. Those words entered my soul and I vowed to accomplish everything and more than a son would have done. I learned how to ride and jump horses. I could outride any girl and almost any boy in town. I studied Greek with the preacher next door until I was finally allowed to attend the local academy. I received the highest marks in mathematics and languages at Johnston Academy, and I was the only girl in the class. And when I finished at the Johnston Academy, I tied for the highest award in Greek, and I received a Greek testament as a prize. Oh, I rushed home that afternoon, so proud to show it to my father. And he just repeated his desire from five years previous. I wish you were a boy. At first, I thought it was impossible for him to see that a girl could accomplish so much. But as I grew, as I learned about our world, I realized it was truly impossible for a girl to accomplish as much as a boy. Girls were not, are still not allowed to attend many schools and universities. I had my sights set on attending Union College, where my beloved brother Eleazar had attended, but they would not accept me. So I received my education at the female seminary in Troy, 
established by Miss Emma Willen. However, I learned much more after I left the seminary. During the time this country was formed and the Great Revolution, the first congressman argued that a woman's obligations to her husband substituted her obligations that as a citizen she would have to the state. These free thinking revolutionaries, as they call themselves, defended coverture, the device through which women lost their civil identity and rights as a protection women deserved from serving on juries, paying taxes, and the draft. Mrs. Adams herself, while writing to her husband John when he was attempting to form this republic, foresaw the rebellion that is brewing amongst women in the present day. In the new code of laws, she wrote, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not to the ladies. We are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Now, after I finished at the female seminary, I often visited my cousin Libby Smith in Peterborough. Libby's father was Garrett Smith, my mother's cousin. Mr. Smith was an intellectual man, and his hospitalities were generous to an extreme and dispensed to all classes of society. He enthusiastically supported a variety of reforms, temperance, abolitionism, vegetarianism, though I cannot claim to be in favor of the latter. I simply loved being at his house. There were always a, a dozen or more interesting people visiting from all over the country. It was at Mr. Smith's that I really became interested in the abolitionist question. And it was there in Peterborough that I met Henry Stanton in the fall of 1839. I was 24 years of age, nearly an old maid according to my sisters, and Henry was 34. At that time, Henry was an abolitionist and an aspiring politician. Indeed, Henry was employed by the American Anti-Slavery Society to travel and give abolitionist speeches. Hearing of his travels, what he had witnessed, and his passionate arguments to end this horrible injustice to the Negroes made me quite eager to take up the banner and argue for abolition as well. When Henry asked for my hand in marriage, I consented with my whole heart. Soon afterwards, Henry shared with me his happy news. He had been elected as a delegate to represent America at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London and would need to sail in early May. Therefore, our wedding date was set for May 1st, 1840, and our wedding trip would encompass his business in London. Now, I had two requests for our wedding ceremony before I would take my vows. I insisted that the word obey be struck from the vows, for I wanted this to be a marriage of equals. I also kept my maiden name, declaring that I would be known as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, rather than Mrs. Henry Stanton. I refused to lose my identity completely to my husband, no matter the depth of love that I had for him. And just a few days after our wedding, 
Henry and I sailed for London on the Montreal. I was determined to have fun, though. I heard one of those snooty male passengers say that a lady was to keep to her own sphere and not meddle in the business of men. This was not the first time I had heard this from a man. Women should stay in their own sphere. And why is it called a sphere? Are there no other shapes in the world we may use to describe such a complete way a woman is isolated when forced into a sphere? From my childhood, I saw that men were allowed to go into politics, into business, into law, and generally into the world. Women were allowed to stay at home, and that was their sphere. Even when I was sailing on a ship, sailing to the horizon with only God to direct my path, there seemed to be no limits to a man's world but strict limits to a woman's. And the people who always traced those limits I saw were men. Now, upon our arrival in London, Henry and I met with other convention delegates, and I was immediately taken with Mrs. Lucretia Mott, who had also traveled from America. Mr. and Mrs. Mott were both delegates, and Mrs. Mott had been lecturing on abolition for years. She was used to being treated as an equal, for that was the Quaker way of doing things. However, we quickly saw that in London, at a convention to discuss and debate the cruelty of one race of men, enslaving and degrading another race of men, there was no room for women to enter that discussion. Not even allowed to step inside the meeting room. Now I realize I was not an official delegate, but Mrs. Mott was. What purpose did it serve to invite learned and experienced abolitionists and orators from across the ocean when they were not allowed to take part in these proceedings on account of their sex? Henry didn't like me to make a fuss and even asked that I conduct myself more demurely. Eventually, after a number of arguments and one hasty vote, it was decided that women were allowed to enter the room where the convention would be, take place, where they were not allowed to talk. What is so dangerous? about women talking, I wonder. What are others afraid we will say? So all the women present were herded into a railed off area. William Lloyd Garrison was present. Yes, that great abolitionist had come to represent America. Mr. Garrison was the only man who was so outraged by the proceedings that he joined us in the railed off area out of loyalty. He said, I can take no part in the convention that strikes down the most sacred rights of all women. Now, all the American delegates stayed at the same boarding house. And in the evenings, after the day's meetings, speeches and debates were over, I took particular note of the way Mrs. Mott dealt with those delegates she disagreed with, some of whom would not take her seriously as an abolitionist. Calmly, skillfully, Mrs. Mott parried their attacks, now by her quiet humor turning the laugh on them, and then by her earnestness and dignity silencing the ridicule and sneers. I learned the best way to listen and offer a verbal counterattack, and I eventually adopted those techniques. Truly, Mrs. Mott was to me an entirely new revelation of womanhood. 
I saw every opportunity to be by her side and continually plied her with questions. I had never heard a woman say what, as a Scotch Presbyterian, I had scarcely dared to think. When I first heard that I had the same right to think for myself that Luther, Calvin, and John Knox had, and had the same right to be guided by my own convictions. Well, I felt at once a sense of dignity and freedom. Mrs. Mott encouraged me to read the women's rights writings of Mary Wollstonecraft, Frances Wright, and the Grimke sisters. In 1838, Sarah Grimke published Letters on the Equality of Sexes and the Condition of Women. And in it, she wrote, I ask no favors for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they will take their feet from off our necks and permit us to stand upright on the ground which God has deigned us to occupy. Each day, Mrs. Mott and I discussed women's sufferings and their unequal treatment. We agreed that we would work together for women's rights, though not forgetting the condition of the enslaved Negro. As Mrs. Mott and I walked home from the boarding house, arm in arm, we resolved to hold a convention as soon as we returned to America and form a society to advocate the rights of women. It was nearly eight years between the time Mrs. Mott and I had the idea in London to putting it into practice. Why? Well, perhaps that because in everyday life, women's rights always seem to take second place to women's work. And there is always work for women to do. Now, upon our return to America, Henry and I lived with my parents in Johnston while Henry read law with my father. In 1845, our new little family then relocated to Boston for a few years, which I much prefer to Johnston. Henry had purchased for us a house, newly furnished, with beautiful views of Boston Bay, and it was all I could design. And it was in Boston that we met and discoursed with other like-minded reformers, Bronson Alcott, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Frederick Douglass. However, Henry's law practice did not flourish in Boston, as was his hope. My father had to be prevailed upon to lend us one of his real estate holdings, a nice large house in Seneca Falls in the western part of New York. We moved to our new home in 1847. Well, I moved there first, having left the children with my mother for a short time. Henry was gone most of the year, lecturing, politicking, attending to legal business in New York City and Albany. And it fell to me to tidy up the house, which desperately needed improvements. I was engaged from morning till night with carpenters, masons, and, and other laborers. I quickly learned that skilled servants were nigh on impossible to obtain this far away from Boston. Maids and nursemaids were as scarce as the teeth on hens. Now, when, when Henry traveled, he would write to me such long letters, begging me to write back, saying how lonely he was without me. I only had time to write one letter to each of his four. He didn't understand that I simply had no time to sit and write to him. He had no comprehension of my life in my sphere, as it was called. As the months progressed, I could not believe 
that a world of household and childbearing drudgery was the only thing in my future. I concluded I, I was lonely and suffering from a type of mental hunger. My experience at the World Anti-Slavery Convention, all I had heard and read of the legal status of women and the oppression I saw everywhere together swept across my soul, intensified now by many personal experiences. It seemed as if all the elements had conspired to impel me to some onward step. I could not tell what to do or where to begin. My only thought was of a public meeting for protest and discussion. It was with relief that in early July, 1848, I accepted an invitation from my dear Mrs. Mott to meet with other ladies in the home of Jane Hunt in Waterloo. I had not arrived that day with a desire to complain about my personal frustrations in life. What angered me the most was the general condition of women who had no say in anything from where they would live, how many children they would bear, and in some cases, whom they would marry. Not even a say in the government of their own families. A husband was allowed to beat his wife with a stick as long as it was no wider than his thumb, as well as drink away any money either one of them had earned. A woman wasn't even allowed to leave her husband, though he was allowed to divorce her. I thought of those poor Irish families who lived down the street from me and the haggard wives who kept those houses. Who can measure the mountains of sorrow and suffering endured in unwelcome motherhood, in the abodes of ignorance, poverty, and vice, where terror-stricken women and children are the victims of strong men frenzied with passion and intoxicating drink. All the ladies present agreed that something must be done to improve the plight of women, and we decided to host a women's rights convention soon on July 19th and 20th, just a few days hence. So I arranged to use the Methodist Church in Seneca Falls for the meetings and placed a small announcement in the local newspaper. A convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious conditions and rights of women. I knew not how many women or men would accept our invitation to meet, but Mrs. Mott, Mrs. Hunt, Mrs. McClintock, and the others, we strove to prepare for whomever or whatever may come. The first day of the convention was reserved only for women to meet and discuss, but on the second day, we welcomed over 300 men and women, including, I was pleased to see, Mr. Frederick Douglass. I was called upon to read the document the other organizers and I had written, the Declaration of Sentiments. We had intentionally modeled it after Mr. Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, for we saw our struggle equal to that of the revolutionary struggle against the tyranny of King George. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man towards women, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has withheld from her 
rights which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners. Having deprived her of this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he has oppressed her on all sides. He has made her, if married, in the eyes of the law, civilly dead. He has taken from her all rights in property, even to the wages she earns. The declaration continued with many resolutions proposed, then adopted by the women present. Mrs. Mott added, resolved that the speedy success of our cause depends upon the zealous and untiring efforts of both men and women for the overthrow of the monopoly of the pulpit, for the securing to women an equal participation with men in the various trades, professions, and commerce. And I added, resolved that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. Many women present were shocked and some appeared even frightened when I read that statement aloud. Mrs. Mott was at first nervous to boldly state that women wanted the right to vote. She cautioned me, Lizzie, they will make us look ridiculous. She, Mrs. Hunt, Mrs. McClintock, and, and I had not called this convention with the sole desire to declare that women should have the right to vote. However, once it was in my head, I would not push it away. This is the only avenue by which women will be able to change the world they live in. By obtaining the right to vote, women will be able to have a say in the laws that govern them. We should not feel so sorely grieved if no man who had not attained the full statue of a Webster, Clay, Van Buren, or Garrett Smith could claim the right of the elective franchise, but to have drunkards, idiots, horse racing, rum selling rowdies, ignorant foreigners, and silly boys fully recognized while we ourselves are thrust out from all the rights belonging to citizens, it is too grossly insulting to be longer quietly submitted to. The right is ours. Have it, we must, and use it, we will. Now, at the conclusion of that first convention, 68 women and 32 men signed their name to the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions. I felt exhilarated to have this outpouring of support for the rights of women. I was immediately prevailed upon to organize a similar conference in another part of the state, as well as speak on this topic. I, with no experience, no qualifications like that of Mrs. Mott or the Mrs. Grimke, I was asked to make a speech. The first time in my life I had spoken to mixed company was when I stood up on July 19th to read out the Declaration of Sentiments. But here I was asked to speak in September of that year in Waterloo in October in Farmington. I'm certain that you're aware that not everyone was pleased with the results of that first convention. Soon afterward, well, many published opinions, which were written by men, were scathing. One newspaper called it a most shocking and unnatural incident. If our ladies will insist on voting and legislating, where, gentlemen, will be our dinners and our elbows? Where are domestic firesides 
and the holes in our stockings. Many newspapers wrote headlines such as Hen Convention and The Reign of Petticoats. The Philadelphia Public Ledger simply stated, a woman is nobody. Dismissing not only the hard work and rhetoric that had been put forth to accomplish such a convention, but also dismissing the hard work of the wives, the mothers, and indeed the hired servants toiling in the large houses of those Philadelphia newspaper men. Obtaining the vote is simply one item in a comprehensive agenda aimed at improving the status of all women in every area of life. I'll share another one with you, that of women's costume. Some years ago, in January 1851, my cousin Libby Miller, nay Smith, visited me in Seneca Falls wearing the new Turkish dress consisting of long trousers topped by a short dress that stopped halfway down the leg. No petticoats or corset, but with a wide sash at the waist. Oh, I was delighted with this new option in attire for women's clothing. It's quite impractical. Today's fashions with the cage crinoline assist in small ways, but still make the simplest chores around the house a burden. This Turkish dress made things such as caring for children, climbing stairs, or hauling laundry so much easier. I quickly made my own short skirt outfit, as did a few other ladies in Seneca Falls. My friend, Amelia Bloomer, drew up the pattern and printed it in her own magazine, The Lily. Soon this outfit became known as Bloomers, and poor Amelia herself was lampooned and ridiculed in the press for what people saw as her invention. My own father was aghast when he heard that I wore such clothing and demanded that I wear regular clothes when I traveled to visit him in Johnston. Even my young sons, Daniel, Henry, and Garrett were embarrassed to be seen with me. It was as if men wanted to believe that women didn't even have legs underneath their skirts. In 1853, I finally ceased wearing the short skirt as we called it. Arguing for women's right to vote was more important than arguing for women's right to wear the attire of her choice. It took longer to convince Susan to cease wearing the short skirt, but she ultimately agreed with me as well. Susan, dear Susan and I met in 1851. Though at times I feel as if I've known her my entire life, Amelia introduced me to Miss Anthony, who was visiting at her house as I passed by them on a street corner in Seneca Falls. And I liked Susan right away with her good, earnest face and her genial smile. However, I admit that I was distracted by the probable behavior of my three mischievous boys who had been busily exploring the premises. And I therefore, I failed to invite Susan back to my house for tea, but I encouraged her to write to me and we quickly formed a friendship through the post. Before the year was out, I realized we needed each other. We each saw the other possessed talents deficient in ourselves. Susan was painstaking, deliberate and untiring. I was quick. I was daring and I had a way with words. I am the better writer, she the better critic. She supplied the facts and statistics, I the philosophy and the rhetoric. And together we have made arguments that have stood unshaken by the storms of long years, arguments that no man has answered. 
our speeches may be considered the united product of our two brains. So entirely one are we that not one feeling of envy or jealousy has ever shattered our lives. And quite possibly equal in importance, I have discovered that we are both good at lifting up each other's spirits. In late 1853, I was asked to speak at the New York Assembly on the topic of women's rights on February 14th, 1854. When my father, Judge Cady, heard that I would speak to the New York Assembly, he invited me to visit Johnston on my journey to Albany. I stood in his study where I had seen, I had seen him discuss various laws almost exclusively with other men. And I read him my speech, calling for the end of women's sufferings, mental, spiritual, educational, economical, legal, and at times physical at the hands of men. His reaction was difficult to ascertain. He said, surely you have had a happy, comfortable life with all your wants and needs supplied. How can a young woman tenderly brought up who has had no bitter personal experience, feel so keenly the wrongs of her sex. Where did you learn this lesson? How could I tell him that I learned it in this room, almost at his feet? How could he understand that I learned this lesson from him? My father was embarrassed that I, his daughter, would be so bold, so unladylike as to speak in public. It didn't matter that the speech was good. It didn't matter that I was as good as a boy and had accomplished more than a son ever would have. My father wanted to oppress my opinions, goals, and dreams simply because I was a woman. When I gave the speech, no one in my family was there to support me. Only Susan came. I did have a fair amount of praise for the speech, and of course, there were critics. One Albany newspaper called me one of those unsexed women who would step out of their true sphere again trying to trap women in a sphere. I shared those articles with Susan calling the editors and journalists men with heads the size of apples. Afterwards, my father said the speech had been a very expensive one hinting that he would disinherit me if I continued down this road. I said, I intend that it will be a very profitable one. Of course, I intended to continue to fight for women's rights. The next few years were very full, full of life, as I welcomed little Harriet in January, 1856. I thought Harriet would be my last child and even promised Susan as much as she was terribly impatient with each of my confinements. However, Robert surprised us by arriving in March, 1859. Susan saw to it that every minute not spent in preparing for or recovering from another childbirth was full of discussion and writing, sometimes for women's rights, sometimes for temperance, and others for advocating for the co-education of children, a notion still resisted by so many institutions. Our friendship has become the most important in my life. In time, Susan relied on me to write speeches, 
She would then deliver at the dozens of locations where she was asked to speak in New England and New York alone. I still have one of the letters from nearly 10 years previous. I laughed when reading it, though I know she would have scowled at my momentary mirth. She wrote, home getting along towards 12 o'clock Thursday evening, 5th of June, 1856. And Mrs. Stanton, not a word written on that address for the teacher's conference this week was to be leisure to me and lo, our maid had a miscarriage on Tuesday and one lady visitor came and today a man and mercy only knows when I will get a moment. And what is worse, as the Lord knows full well, that is if I do get all the time there is, I can't get up a decent document. So for the love of me, for the sake, for the reputation of womanhood, I beg you with one baby on your knee and another at your feet and four boys whistling, buzzing, hallooing mama, set yourself about your work. It is of but small moment who writes the address, but the best moment that be well done. Promise you to work hard. Oh, how hard. But oh, Mrs. Stanton, don't say no, nor don't delay it for a moment, for I must have it all done and almost commit it to memory. The teacher's conference comes the 5th and 6th of August, the Saratoga Women's Rights Convention, the 13th and 14th, and probably the Newport, the 20th and 21st. During July, I want to speak certainly twice at Avon, Clifton, Sharon, Ballston Spring, and Lake George. Now, will you load my gun, leaving me only to pull the trigger and let fly the powder and ball? I, I haven't half written out the points that I have thought of, but I will send you what I have to stir you up. Do get all on fire and be as cross as you please. You remember Mr. Stanton told you how cross you always get in speech. Goodbye, Susan B. Oh, my reply to her was thus, Seneca Falls, 10th June, 1856. Dear Susan, your servant is not dead, but liveth. Imagine me day in and day out, watching, bathing, dressing, nursing, and promenading the previous contents of a little crib in the corner of my room. I pace up and down these two chambers of mine like a caged lioness, longing to bring nursing and housekeeping cares to a close. Is your speech to be exclusively on the point of educating the sexes together or as to the best manner of educating women? Have you horse man's essays on that? Come here and I will do what I can to help you with your address if you will hold baby and make the pudding. You too must rest, Susan. Let the world alone a while. We cannot bring about a moral revolution in a day or a year. Now I have two daughters. I feel fresh strength to work for women. Good night. Yours in love, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Whenever I saw a stately Quaker girl coming across my lawn, I knew that some happy convocation of the sons of Adam were to be set on by their ears by one of our appeals or resolutions. That little portmanteau stuffed with facts was open. And there we had what the, what the Reverend John Smith or the Honorable Richard Rowe had said, false interpretations of Bible texts, the statistics of women robbed of their property, shut out of some college, half paid for their work, and the reports of some disgraceful trial, injustice enough to turn any woman's thoughts from stockings and puddings. And then we would get out our pens and write articles for papers or petition to the legislature 
Indite letters to the faithful here and there. Stir up the women in Ohio, Pennsylvania, or Massachusetts. We never met without issuing some pronouncement toe on some question. In thought and sympathy, we were one. And in the division of labor, we exactly complemented each other. In writing, we did better work than either could have done alone. Night after night, by an old fashioned fireplace, we plotted and planned the coming agitation. And soon Susan was meeting me in New York City. For early in 1861, Henry moved the entire family here, where he had a job with the customs office. Our boy, Henry Stanton Jr., joined the army once war was declared, but we still had a nursery full of children at home. As the presidential election of 1860 drew near, Mrs. Mott, Susan, Lucy Stone, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, and I all agreed that we should focus our time and energies on abolition. For my part, I made sure the speeches I gave illustrated the similarities of the suffering of women and the black men. I said to you, white men, the world throws open wide her gates, but the black man and the woman are born to shame. However, even after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation went into effect on January 1st, 1863, we would not stop until we obtained freedom for all the slaves. By August 1864, Susan and I had collected over 400,000 signatures on petitions to abolish slavery in every American state. Women everywhere have done so much for the sake of this union. Throughout the war, women nursed soldiers, followed their men's on campaign, cooking and cleaning. Women taught the children in schools when teachers enlisted. Women ran farms and businesses deserted by their husbands when they went off to fight. I have even heard that some women disguised themselves as men and enlisted in the army as soldiers, so passionate was their national pride. And now, now when our nation is at peace once more and the Negroes are finally free from slavery, why won't Congress recognize the work women have done when I was able to discuss these new proposals with Senator Sumner and others, these men kept telling the women present to be patient. Patient, men and angels, what else have I been? The newspapers now talk of women asking for their rights as greedy and tomfoolery before it is the Negro's hour, we are told. Did the government not think some of the Negroes were women? There would be more sense in insisting on man's limitations because he cannot be a mother than on a woman's because she can be. Surely maternity is an added power and development in some of the most tender sentiments of the human heart and not a limitation. Some will argue but it unfits her for much of the world's work. To that I say yes, and it fits her for much more of it. A large share of human legislation would be better done by her because of this deep experience. If one half the effort had been expended to exalt the feminine element that has been made to degrade it, we should have reached a natural equilibrium long ago. Either sex in isolation is robbed of one half its power for the accomplishment of any given work. But a new era is dawning 
upon this world. When old might to right must yield the battle blade to clerky pen, when millions now under the iron heel of the tyrant will assert their manhood, when women yielding to the voice of the spirit within her will demand recognition of her humanity, when her soul grown too large for her chains will burst the bands around her and stand redeemed, regenerated, and disenthralled. Now is the time, now emphatically, for women of this country to buckle on the armor that can best resist the weapons of the enemy, ridicule and holy horror. Our struggle will be hard and long, but our triumph will be complete and forever. We do not expect our path will be strewn with the flowers of popular favor that our banner, which we have flung to the wind, will be fanned by the breath of popular applause. No, we know that over the nettles of prejudice and bigotry will be our way, that upon our banner will beat the dark storm cloud of oppression from those who have entrenched themselves behind the strong bulwark of might, of force, and who have fortified their position by every means holy and unholy. Unmoved, we will bear it aloft. Undaunted, we will unfurl it to the gale. We know that the storm cannot rend from it a shred, that the rolling thunder will be sweet music to our ears, and the electric flash will but more clearly show us the glorious words inscribed upon it, equality of rights. Thank you so much for joining me today. That was, that was great. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um yeah that was that was very powerful thank you laura uh, thank you stanton um um you know it's towards the end there um you know i'm it's it's sounding very um you know those statements uh ring true you know still here in 2020 um and we have you know still some work to do but i want to thank you laura um i want to thank uh uh, you for putting on this program for us, especially virtually, you know, we're trying something new. Laura said this is the first time uh, she's done something like this as well, too. So um, if you have any questions, uh, leave those questions in the comments here. Uh, we can have those answered here at the end of the program. Uh, would love to hear uh, from you watching out there what questions you may have uh, uh, for Laura. As she just portrayed Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I appreciate everybody for 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 tuning in the entire time um and uh yeah i was taken aback yeah i mean i'm i was excited to hear this and um yeah almost no words for me at this moment but well good thank you Lord, do you have anything yeah you do a great yeah. job we appreciate it hello again everyone i've uh, i've magically transformed uh from Mrs. Uh, Katie Stanton, and uh, I would be happy to answer any uh, questions that you have. You know, Laura would be happy to answer. I've set Mrs. Katie Stanton just aside for now. This is something that I, I had been thinking about um, portraying Elizabeth Katie Stanton for quite a number of years before I actually uh, put pen to paper, so to speak, and, and did, I had been researching her but it, uh, I, I had a, a little bit of a, a kick and a push to get ready, and um, and then I, I put this presentation together, um, and I debuted it uh, in February of last year, and so I'm I'm very proud of that, and it was truly very emotional for me to even do the the research and to write this presentation because. 
I kept going back to a, a number of uh, primary sources. Uh, Mrs. Katie Stanton wrote her own autobiography. Of course, so many of her letters, her speeches and articles have been saved. And so, so much of what is in her own voice, um, uh, I, other researches, other biographies can look at. So when I started to look at those documents and especially the documents um, that I quoted from near the end of my presentation, those were a, a few paragraphs of direct quotes that she wrote actually in the late 1840s. And when I was reading that and when I confirmed that this wasn't written at the end of her life, this was written at the very beginning when she was getting herself into um, the fight for women's rights. I actually cried. I actually broke down and cried because I realized that these words are so universal and that's actually rather sad that these words could be used today to, to describe the struggle that women and other, uh, other social minorities are going through, um, but speaking specifically about women today. Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah, I, I noticed that as you were, you know, in many things that you were saying, you know, just things that still, you know, sadly, you know, ring true today, uh, you know, even when you're talking about, um, you know, um, uh, Stanton's father wishing that she was a boy, I mean, that was, that was, I mean, emotional, and I'm sure Stanton wasn't the only one who faced that, and, you know, still many, um, you know, women after, I'm sure that happened as well too. And it's it's still sad that it continued to ring on. Yes, oh. yes, you're absolutely right. Um, we have a question, uh, uh, Barb asked if you'll answer in character or as Laura, but I think you addressed that already, gonna answer sure. as Laura. Um, uh, Laura Keller uh, asked if you do, um, do you do presentations of any other women? And if so, where can we get your contact information? <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to uh, have um, Pat share my contact information. My um, website is simply my name, laurafkeys.com. And I also have a uh, Facebook page that everyone is welcome to go to. That's Facebook backslash, I'm sorry, backslash. After speaking in, as Elizabeth Katie Stanton for an hour, I don't know the word backslash. Um, I'm sorry, that's historic voices with an S. Um, so if you're on, if, if, uh, most of you are on Facebook, if you're watching this, um, just feel free to um, search when this is over, historic voices. And I always list where I'm going to give presentations, even now virtually. Um, to answer the first part of your question, yes, I have actually, um, I portray a couple other women from history. Starting in 2008, I started portraying Mary Lincoln. And um, I've been portraying her ever since. As a librarian, I am very uh, a firm believer in accurate portrayals um, and accurate research. And uh, since I have another degree in English literature, I, I write all of my presentations. And that's, that's very important to me. Um, about seven years ago, I started portraying Laura Ingalls Wilder. And again, I focus on portraying her very accurately. And um, that has actually frustrated a number of uh, audience members in the past who want a version of a television show, which I actually can't even legally give them because television uh, scripts are copywritten. Um, and I, as I mentioned, I started portraying Elizabeth Cady Stanton last year. Two of my lesser known characters that I still enjoy portraying, one is Mary Harlan, um, who was the daughter of uh, an Iowa senator, uh, Iowa senator serving during the Civil War. Mary grew up and became the daughter-in-law of Mary Todd Lincoln. And Mary Harlan Lincoln uh, had a very interesting life of her own. And um, I also have fun portraying a fictional character. I portray Irene Adler, the only woman to have outsmarted Sherlock Holmes. And I have a lot of fun telling a Sherlock Holmes story from a completely different perspective. And again, being as accurate as possible to uh, the Victorian era. Um, so that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I got a, got a comment from uh, Barb. Barb says, thanks for your perspective on the bloomers and simple tasks. It never occurred to me how hard it was to do anything in those clothes. 
it's very difficult. Um, even today, I am, uh, once again, my, my focus on accuracy leads me to dress completely accurately. Um, I am wearing a corset, three layers of underclothing, and a cage crinoline, um, which I would do for any of my, uh, you know, live performances. For the other characters that I portray, I wear appropriate clothing and underclothing for them. And um, you're absolutely right, Barb, it was difficult. That being said, uh, if a woman, especially in the early part of her marriage, when Mrs. Katie Stanton, um, there probably was not enough family income to employ more than one basic maid. Um, if we're talking about someone in, in that social status, it is unlikely that she wore um, you know, layers of petticoats every day if it's if it's laundry day, if it's wash day. Just like modern people, if it's a cleaning day, you're gonna clean out a closet or something, you're not wearing your nicest dress for church, are you? You're wearing a bit bit a lower, lower clothing, um, not not your nice church dress. So that still existed in the past. And so clear what I'm wearing is uh, you know, a, a nice dress, of course, because as was mentioned earlier, I'm portraying Mrs. Katie Stanton as she would be welcoming people, um, you know, for, for an afternoon of discussion, for an afternoon of, of entertaining, a tea, things like that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I got a question. Um, so the historian and the researcher coming out in me, you were talking earlier about, you know, researching primary sources and documents. Was there, like, did, did you research into, like, is there a particular Elizabeth Cady Stanton, like, collection or set of papers, or there's certain repositories or archives or, you know, libraries, museums that you reached out to a whole bunch in order to do the research for this presentation? And would you happen to know if they're digitally available in case anybody would want to, you know, take a look at those themselves um, Many, from the comfort uh, of their own homes? Yeah, many things are digitally available. Um, they really are. Uh, I'm trying to find my uh, my notes. Isn't it convenient sitting here on my uh, on my computer? <laughs> um, there's a handful of different repositories based on her, um, uh, you know, her her letters and her papers. If we can just say papers generally, as I mentioned before, because she wrote so prolifically, and of course because as someone writes letters, they are, no, they are literally no longer hers. They, are, they now belong to the recipient of those letters. And so over time, it, it, took, it took time for people to gather those letters. So um, Rutgers University, that's rutgers.edu, has quite a number of items from both Elizabeth Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony that have been digitized. Um, and that is where I found a lot of documents um, I did do some original research in uh, Seneca Falls itself. I traveled to Seneca Falls. Oh, awesome. And, um, yeah, there's a wonderful museum there uh, run by the National Park Service. Um, I, I don't know if they're open at the moment, but you know they've got a website if anyone wants to take a road trip. And there's also, of course, um, a house, the house that um, Elizabeth and, and Henry lived in, which her father owned, but they lived in for quite a while. That has been restored and is open as a museum. And um, the actu actually the National Women's Hall of Fame also resides in Seneca Falls. And that's uh, very interesting as well. Um, so yes, there's a lot of things that are online. And of course, the works that she herself wrote, for example, her autobiography is available online through Project Gutenberg because it's out of copyright, and a few of her other publications that she made during her lifetimes, one of which was she entitled The Women's Bible, um, which was very controversial and got her excommunicated um, because she pointed out a variety of scriptures in the Bible that actually pointed to the complete equality of the sexes that for a number of centuries, um, misogynistic preachers had ignored those or glossed over those. And so she simply wrote a book, she entitled it The Women's Bible, in which she pointed out these verses, she discussed them, she compared them, etc., as a theologian would. 
And um, that was not very well received at all. Hmm. Wow. So quite a few, quite a few resources there too. And the, yeah. I'll have to check out the, uh, the women's Bible too. That sounds interesting. Uh, yes. Yes. If your local library, um, they might have a copy. If, if not, then um, it's, it's very possible you could find it online because those two um, books are out of copyright. Sure. Um, I've got a question from um, another Laura, Laura Keller. Um, she says, were all Susan B. Anthony's speeches written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Uh, I wouldn't say all of them. I, as I mentioned in my presentation, which was a, um, a quote, uh, the speeches can be considered a result of our combined brains. Um, and, and that is what both Susan and Elizabeth said at various times in their friendship when they were interviewed in a paper or, or, you know, somehow the topic came up of how do you write your speeches, their, their answer very consistently was we write them together. I'm certain that there were situations where, as we heard in the letter that I quoted, um, Susan was in a hurry and she simply asked uh, Elizabeth, could you just write this for me? I'm sure that happened, but also getting to know them as I kind of got to know both of these ladies through their writings, more than likely, it was still a combination of both of them we could pick apart the words and estimate, okay, Elizabeth wrote 90% of this and Susan wrote 10, but the, the truth is they still collaborated on it. So that is, that is my personal belief. They collaborated on their speeches. Cool. Um, uh, back to the women's Bible real quick, just a comment from Nancy. She said, I just got the women's Bible online. So it's out there. Haven't read it yet. So it's out there. She said, so. Um, yeah. uh, Barb asked a question. Can you say something about her relationship with Frederick Douglass? Um, Elizabeth was, she did meet Frederick Douglass in Boston. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, he did attend the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls. I know that she had a, a lot of respect for Mr. Douglass. It was about 1866, about the time that this presentation is set, when they did have um, quite a falling out. And I, I believe they were not permanently uh, angry with each other. I think in later years they did come together, but it was quite a falling out because um, as I hinted at in my presentation, in 1866, the um, constitutional amendment that would list um, citizenship, that would give citizenship to anyone born, no, I'm sorry, that was the 13th Amendment. Um, this constitutional amendment gave men the right to vote, so, so all men, because clearly since early 1865, when the 13th, amend, 13th and 14th Amendments um, had been put forth uh, with President Lincoln's help, um, there was still a huge amount of backlash of, of people who did not, even, even though freed slaves were now legally citizens, because remember they had not been considered citizens before, they were now legally citizens, there was a huge backlash saying, well, you might be citizens, but we're still not gonna let you to vote. So in 1866, um, there was a lot of legislation saying, okay, all men can vote. All citizens, all male citizens can vote. And of course it says other words than that, but that's the gist of it. That angered both Susan and Elizabeth and all of the other agitators, all of the other advocates for women's rights a great deal. Because as I, as I quoted in my presentation, they saw idiots. They truly called them idiots, horse racing, rum selling rowdies, um, be allowed to vote. And educated, learned women were not allowed to vote. And even though this, this amendment in 1866 would give Black men the constitutional right to vote, it's true, Elizabeth did not support it because she argued it should give all you know, also that it should be written in there, all citizens 
should vote or or some kind of qualification. She was she was willing to discuss a qualification. Only college educated women could vote. Only this, only that. She was willing to discuss levels. Um, and modern uh, audiences and modern articles are very critical of specifically Elizabeth Cady Stanton, even though for the record, Susan B. Anthony also um, uh, supported, also partnered with Elizabeth in not supporting the documents. And modern critics have labeled Elizabeth a racist for her non-support of that. But you have to look at the bigger issue. She could not in good conscience support that because it was against everything she had been working for for roughly 20 years. There's a lot there, yeah, with um, that relationship and you know that that whole situation taking place. Um, yeah, yeah. But thanks for thanks for answering that, Laura. Um, uh, got any other questions? Um, you know, feel free to continue to send those in. But um, you know, I want to thank Laura again for uh, being our presenter today and doing an amazing job. That was an oh, awesome, awesome portrayal. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Um, thanks for you know. You know, given a voice to such an important uh, figure, you know, not only in United States history, but, you know, world history in general. Um, really, really appreciate that. And, you know, glad that we got had the opportunity to do this virtually. Yes. Um, uh, I know Laura uh, said that this was her first time, and I think it went really well going virtually. Um, you so, you so know, much, maybe this opens the door for other virtual performances uh, from Laura Keys. Uh, we shall see. So. Yes, that sounds very nice. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing my information. If anyone has, um, you know, any specific questions, uh, I can do my best to answer them. Your local library can probably answer them as well if they're about Elizabeth K. Stanton. Um, and if anyone is interested in any future uh, virtual presentations or possibly in-person presentations, just take a look at my, my Facebook page um, or you could ask your local library to, to host me. Whole bunch yeah. of opportunities. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, entirely possible we'll be in contact again. So maybe we'll see another, you know, portrayal of another one of the women that you mentioned earlier um, on the Museum of the Grand Prairie page. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Barb has another comment. She said, great, thanks. Stanton did write a lovely eulogy when Douglas died. Um, so yeah. uh, there's that as well. Um, but thank you again, Laura. You know, again, if you have any other questions, um, you know, can, you can find Laura Keys. Um, her page is Historic Voices on Facebook. And then, uh, Laura, your website is www.laurafkeys.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so feel free to reach out to her. Um, you know, reach out to us if you have any other questions, you know, for the Museum of the Grand Prairie. But again, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks to Laura for the lovely presentation. Really appreciated uh, the good questions and comments as well too uh, here at the end. But uh, you know, go enjoy the rest of your Sundays. It's a beautiful day here in Champaign, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, thanks for tuning in um, and we will see you next time. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. thank you very much.